Good morning. Welcome to uh, Kingsliff Church this morning. And we just want to formally welcome you to our second session of In Search for Relevance. Just by show of hands, how many of you were able to join last night, whether here in person or online? Awesome. So welcome back to you guys. And to those who are here for the first time, we want to say welcome to you as well. Looking forward to hearing more of what Herb Larson has got to say. I'd like to encourage you just for, we're just going to take a moment and we're going to sing a couple of songs. Um, but before that, I just encourage you, just turn to the person next to you or behind you or in front of you and just shake hands with somebody. Say good day. You just, just take 10, 15 seconds and give a friendly welcome. Good morning. Nice to see you, Britt. We want to say welcome as well to our online audience and uh, super excited to have you all here with us today. We just invite you to... We're going to sing a couple of songs like we did last night, and um, I just want to invite you to think about the, the meaning of these words as we sing them. You're welcome to join along if you'd like to sing as well, and um, this first song is, is called The Lion and the Lamb. Of the world, his blood. 
roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the sing one more and um, this song is called 10,000 Reasons and in light of in light of kind of what Herb was sharing last night about you know finding relevance in how everything in life seems that I've tried to put my hope in whether it be money or relationships or chasing some dream some goal and nothing's ever satisfied that I've tried in those areas but there's one thing that has satisfied it for me personally that's Jesus Christ and he's given relevance to my life, and because of that, I think I have 10,000 reasons to give him praise. And so if you can resonate with that this morning, I just encourage you to join in. Oh 
guys can take a seat. Morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. Can I see by a raise of hands, who were here last night? So quite a few of you, that's good. Who of you are here for the first time? Just raise your hand. A few of you, welcome. We just want to say welcome to all the new people, those that came last night, all the visitors, the regular members. We hope that you all feel very welcome here. Uh, my name is Pastor Quinton. I'm one of the pastors on, on staff here, and we would just want to welcome you um, to our church. We want to say that there's going to be a lunch after this. So we're going to have a great lunch. It's free of charge. You can just join us for that. And so we're going to have a great lunch right after this. And then there'll be another session at 3 o'clock. So there's a, a good time to, to hang around here, get to know a few people. That's why we have these little name tags. Because I don't know about you, Herb mentioned it last, uh, last night as well. I remember faces, but names are a bit difficult. So we put these tags on. If you don't have one, you can get one later. And it's just to to uh, remember the name better. I don't know about you, but if I see how a name is spelt, then I'd be like, oh yeah, I know that's Joshua. I know that that's Dave. I know that that's, you know? And so it just helps you to remember the name. So next time, maybe they don't have the name tag on, but you still remember their name. And as they say, your name is one of the most precious things to you, and it's great to call, us, uh, call individuals on their name. So we just wanted to uh, mention that, the lunch. I also just want to mention, if you do need to go to the restroom, the restroom is just outside, and it's to my left, your right. There's a little passageway there. There's uh, restrooms over there. And then I know that there's quite a few parents here with little bobs, and they might uh, need to step out for a minute. We have a overflow room on the, my left-hand side, your right-hand side out there where there's a, a TV on that's live streaming this, so you'll be able to still listen to this, to this talk. Um, I want to make an announcement for next week. Um, next week is a bit of a bittersweet uh, weekend for us because we at this church have a class that's running at the moment, the Arise class. There's about 46 students, I think, and they've been here for a few months, but next weekend is their graduation weekend. So they're wrapping up, which is quite sad to us, but it's also exciting to know that they're going on to uh, continue to greater things. Next week is actually the 10-year anniversary weekend of Arise, being in Australia, being at this church, and that's a great weekend. So next week, we are going to start our program at 9.30. So if you come at 11, you're going to be late, right? You're going to be like, what's going on? There's already stuff happening. So 9.30 next week, we're going to start with testimonies. We're going to continue at 11 o'clock. And then next week um, in the afternoon, again, we'll have a lunch. And at 3 o'clock, we'll have the grad graduation. So we're going to invite everybody once again to come and join us. It's going to be a really good weekend. We're going to have Ty Gibson here. We're going to have David Ashrick, Matt Parr is coming to visit. We have lots of um, friends coming. It's going to be a big weekend. Lots of parents of the students will be here. Lots of alumni will come. And one of the special things that we're trying to organize for next week is a choir. So if you're a part of Arise or have been part of Arise, there's going to be a special choir next week, and they're practicing at 8.30 next week, Saturday. So please come for that. They're going to, um, where's a Victoria? Maybe Victoria. Victoria over here, uh, she's the one that's leading the charge in that. So you can come and speak to Victoria if you're part of Arise. So this is for current Arise students and previous Arise students. Come and speak to Victoria. There's an email out. It's on the Facebook page. And I just wanted to mention that as well. Now, last night, I asked uh, who came from the furthest point, and I think uh, the furthest point was Sydney, but then I got a message last night to say, actually, no, there's Japan, because we have an online audience as well, and one of our members was watching from Japan. So, welcome to everybody watching online. We're grateful for everybody um, joining us, both in person and online, so it's always good that we can use technology um, in this positive way. One of the things that we do at church um, is that we take up an offering year. And I know many people uh, see churches as a place that just want money. We don't want your money at all. Uh, we think that uh, God gives us what we need. And we want you to have the opportunity to bring some of that money for a good cause, for what you feel God is calling you to do. So we're not going to compel you to bring anything. We're just asking those that want to give an offering today for the running of this facility, for doing the good work that we do at this church, to put it in the offering bags. The deacons will come up now and take up an offering. It's a free will offering. Don't feel obliged to. Uh, we, there's a verse in the Bible that says God loves a cheerful giver. And so if you feel 
that God is calling you today to give some funds. We definitely want to um, encourage you to be a cheerful giver. The more we, we, we give, uh, the blessed our lives are. So we're going to have a prayer over that, and then we'll ask the deacons to take up our, our tithes and offerings. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, it is a privilege for us to be a Lord. Thank you so much that we can take up the tithes and the offerings now. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed our lives so much. Thank you that we can give back, um, Lord, to you. And we know that by giving, we are changed to be more giving in our lives. I pray, Lord, that we will give with a, a cheerful heart. May you use this money to, to do good in this world, to share your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All the children, could you please come up for the children's story? One at a time, one at a time. <laughs> That's it, gather around. Hello, what's your name? I'm going to tell you a special story today. And this story happened to me, my wife, and little Zion here. But he was asleep. And we were staying in a place called Madawi. Does anyone know where Madawi is? <laughs> anyone? There we go. So I can hear someone in the back. Bali. That's right. And we were, we were staying in Madawi, and uh, we were staying with Ayu. And now Ayu was a Hindu princess. She had long, black, silky hair, really high cheekbones. She was a, she was a Hindu princess. And we stayed with her at this place called Ayuma. And uh, we were staying in these little huts and outside the huts there was a communal kitchen and um, we were staying there during the day I was just getting barreled every day and my wife and son were just cheering on the beach for me all day long <laughs> anyway one night we would always everyone that was staying with the princess would come and we would all eat meals together and one night, she was telling us, there's nothing you need to be worried about in Madawi except for the King Cobra. Who knows what a King Cobra is? What is it? It's a big snake. It is. It's a big snake. Do you know what a King Cobra is? It's a snake that can shoot poison out of its mouth. Yes. You're on the money there. That's right. So... Apparently, West Bali is known for king cobras. And lucky for us, we were staying in the jungle. Now, she would tell us, if you hear what sounds like a cat, it's not a cat. It's a king cobra. They make a sound like this. And then they shoot poison into your eyes. It's okay, it's okay. It's just a joke. It's a prank. Yeah, and their folklore was that if you kill a king cobra, you have to walk through a river before you go to sleep at night, or else the king cobra's family will come and get you. Ooh. Anyway, so the next night, we were getting ready for bed. We had our big dinner, and then Ayu, the princess, jumped on her bike and said, I'm going back to Chengu. You guys stay here for the night. Now... There was dogs there. There was three dogs. There was 
Panda, Missy, and Rex. We'll go Rex, right? And these dogs were, as soon as I left, were barking, bark, 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 barking on all, all through the night, bark, bark, bark. I thought, that's funny. Maybe, they just, maybe they're just missing Ayu, the princess. And um, they were barking, barking, barking. And then, boom, all the lights went out. All the power went out in all our huts. And I said, Sav, you better go out there and find out what's going on. <laughs> and, she, and she said, no, no, I've got a broken wrist. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I'll go out there. So I come out the door, and I look out the door, and I thought maybe, we, maybe people have come to come get us. And in the communal kitchen, they still had a light on. So I walk into the kitchen, and Sav's watching me behind the, behind the door in our hut, and I go into the kitchen and find the, the uh, power board, trying to, trying to act like I know what to do. And I, I, didn't figure, I couldn't hear it, and then... I hear a and I look up and in front of me hanging down from the ceiling is this king cobra flared out like this and you know what I did I ducked down and like Mike Tyson I grabbed it like this I tied it in a knot and I threw it at no I'm just joking I saw it, it went, and I ran away, and I ran behind, behind Savannah, and, and I said, you better go in there and get something, that, that's a smart snake, it knew how to turn the lights off, and I quickly, I called Ayu, the princess, I said, hey, um, there's King Cobra here. Um, you're in Chengu, which is like three hours away. Like, what, what do we do? The dogs are barking. And you know what she did? She called her dad. Now, five minutes later, a scooter comes down the long driveway into the middle of Chengu in Ayu's castle, and it was her dad. Now, Ayu's dad was about 130 years old. He was very old. You guys know anyone 130 years old? Well, well, Ayu's dad was. And as soon as he arrived, all the dogs start barking and they sat down in their place. And I thought, whoa, he's going to come save us. And what he does, he said, he didn't say much, but he pointed there and I said, yeah, the snake's over there. And then he just went and put his hand and do, 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 flipping hitting around, trying to make noise, got a stick and starts banging it around. And I was like, yeah, I promised there was a snake. I'm not just making it up. Anyway. What's that? Punched the snake. Yeah, I punched it. And the, and the snake, the snake was gone. And, um, and I used, the princess's dad made us all feel really safe. Now, do you know that there's a father that we can call to make us feel safe? Do you know who that is? 911. <laughs> what is it? God. God, that's right. Now, how do we call God? Do we, do we WhatsApp God like I you did her dad? Do we use WhatsApp? Do we use Zoom? Do we use Skype? How, what do we do when we need a... Hey? We pray. That's right. So next time you get scared or you feel unsafe, remember that you can call our Father in heaven to come and save the day. All right, now go back to your seats. Well, thank you for that scary story. 
The church has psychologists out the back, child psychologists, to, to help the kids through this. <laughs> that was a good story, I have to admit. We have bear, you know, when, when, when I talk to people sometimes, if you've been to Canada, no, you got bear there. And I said, well, you got nine of the 13 most poisonous snakes in the world where you are, and I still come, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, everywhere you go, there's going to be some danger, but anyway, great to be back here this morning. So much appreciate the program so, so far. The music was great. The story is great. The announcements are even good, so that's a positive. And... Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been to this church a couple times before in the past, and uh, love the people and met a lot of people here, and, and so it's just fun to rekindle the friendships that had already started. And where we started last night in our talk was, I was talking about the futility of the chase of life. See, there's basically four things that destroy our happiness and, just, and become a ball and chain to moving forwards in, in life. One of them is the futility of the chase. No matter how hard you drive, no matter how hard you push, it always seems to end nowhere. You just never get to that elusive place where you want. When speaking of elusive, the other one is elusive contentment. What does it take to finally become content in life? And so when I'm sharing with highly affluent people, I usually talk about the elusiveness of contentment because they're in a Worst predicament. See, the higher you go on society's ladder, the less options you have to try to fill that void. Because we all have a void. Another one that we suffer from is regret. The woulda, shoulda, coulda's of life. One of my brothers, I don't know if that's where he got that, if he coined that phrase or if, that, if he got it somewhere, but he always says, oh, woulda, shoulda, coulda, that stock or investment. Woulda, shoulda, coulda, something else. Wished I wouldn't have. That's regret. Regret just drags you down like a ball and chain. And the other one is the unmet expectations. Those four things. Unmet expectations. In other words, you, your expectation is, if I get to this level, I'll be happy and no, don't need to set any more goals. Or if I get this material item, I'll be happy. Don't need anything beyond that. But when you get there, your expectations aren't met. Because what do you do? As soon as you reach a goal, the next rung, we're talking about the wrong, society's ladder. As soon as you reach that goal, what generally happens? Not generally, always happens. You have to set another goal immediately because your expectation of what it would be like to get there is not met. So these are things that drag us down. There's another one that I want to talk about here before I get into the rest of my talk here today, and that is this whole thing about faulty standards of comparison. Kind of a mouthful. Faulty standards of comparison. What do I mean about that? Because we as humans have this human nature where we like to compare ourselves to someone else. But unfortunately, we generally compare our weak points to someone else's strong points. And it destroys where we go in life. Because if you take your weak points and look at someone else's strong point and compare yourself, you come out losing and you have discontentment. But what I'd like to tell some people, because I've had lots of people come and you know, want to talk about counseling or whatever. And, and I talk about this standard of comparison. I've told people, if you want to reset the bar for yourself, go somewhere where they have nothing. In fact, I told one friend of mine, he said, oh, you know, can you give me some business tips or whatever else? And I know his life. He and his wife, well over six figures, both of them, have a house, probably finance of the hilt, fanciest cars, everything else, and they're not content at all, just driving for more, just into oblivion trying to find that. So I told him, I said, well, just so you get an understanding, I said, what you're suffering from, I can tell you, is this whole thing called faulty standard of comparison. You're comparing, you're hanging out with all the other people that are slightly above you in the economic strata. So therefore, you're always feeling underwhelmed about yourself. So I just told him, I said, to help reset your standard, picture this. Just spend some time picturing this. Take your house, your running water, your electricity. We take those for granted. Take your automobiles and supplant them into the most primitive village you can imagine. Maybe it's in Mexico, maybe it's somewhere, you know, wherever. Plant your lifestyle in there now where the richest person in that place happens to have corrugated fiberglass for their roof on their hut. 
What are you going to feel like now when you have what you have right now in that setting? It re helps you reset your, your standard of comparison. Now, here's another interesting one. I'm going to need my water, sorry. Another, another interesting one. And I looked it up yesterday just to get the latest figures. There is a website called Am I Rich? It's basically about trying to talk people into being more charitable, to be, have, you know, take on philanthropic things. But it's called Am I Rich? If you want to look it up, compare your own income. But what I did yesterday morning, I just went online, and I looked up Australian dollars, you know, so we get it all right. So I looked up Australian dollars, and then I started plugging numbers into this to see where you would where you would rate in terms of all the financial earners in the world. And guess what? I started out at one number, and then I bumped it up, down, down, until I found the exact mark. It, at at $84,000, you are in the top 1% of all wage earners in the world. 84000 Australian dollars. You are in the top 1%. We always hear about the one percenters in the world. We're not talking about wealth now, we're talking about income. And if you go to that site, so $84,000 puts you in the top 1% of all income earners in the world. And $42,000 puts you in at the top 5% of everybody in the world. It's called Am I Rich? Just look it up if you want to find out where you are. By doing that, the reason I bring that up, because by doing that, it begins to make you come off of this faulty standard of comparison that we get ourselves caught up in. And that's where I want to segue into my story. Because I was stuck with that faulty standard of comparison most of my life. And what it was this. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to make lots of money. I wanted to accomplish a lot of things. Because to me, it's not just about money. It's about achieving status. And of course, here's what we do know as a fact. Those who become very wealthy, their very next thing that they're after is power. So once you have the wealth, because if you can't accumulate more wealth, because you realize, remember we said, as soon as you set a goal and you get there, you got to set another goal. But after a while, if you keep setting new financial goals, you realize, okay, I'm not going to reach that level of utopia or level of satisfaction I'm looking for. So the very next thing you go after is power. And... That becomes empty. Why do politicians, a lot of them, get into politics? Because they want power. They've already tried the money tree, and it doesn't seem to be fulfilling, so they try that. So my life was always about success and status. Power is status. And so when I finished university, I had just finished spending at least eight years of daydreaming. That's on my grades, you know, high school, I'm a flat D student. You, D is your worst. We have one lower than that, F. I didn't get Fs. The only reason I didn't get Fs, meaning total failure, is because the teachers didn't want me in their class anymore. It's a waste of time. So if they give me a D, they can move me on to the next grade. And I went to three different high schools in four years. And so, so what? I learned a lot by daydreaming. I just spent, I would envision what I'm going to want to do in the future, what I want to accomplish, and I would have it totally planned out in my mind. I did a lot of other daydreaming too, like I was going to be a rock star and all the girls would be chasing me. That was a good daydream. My heart would be pounding. And of course, it's for us hockey, but you, you know, rugby or whatever. I would sit there and picture myself out on the ice and somebody wants to fight and I'd take on six guys. And while I'm sitting there in class, completely oblivious to what the teaching's going on, my heart is pounding. I got adrenaline pumping through my body because that's how good my imagination was. And I'd beat the garbage out of every one of them guys. And then at the end of the game, I get the trophy MVP, most valuable player. I could live all those dreams. Still can, unfortunately. Sometimes, I, you know, my imagination is carried away. But, so... And then through college, I, I realized I had to do both of those now, daydream and academics. Because if I'm going to finish, I have to have a... So I did. I found that balance. Dating, that was a big distraction. But, but I still did a lot of daydreaming, and I did some studying, so I, I got through. But the point is, is during those eight years of 
full-time daydreaming, I actually knew what I wanted to do, I knew where I wanted to go, and I knew exactly what I wanted to accomplish. And so when I finished school, I just hit the road running. Hit it as hard as I can. Did teach a couple of years just to get myself, you know, into the workplace. But then after that, went into business. Everything went beyond our expectations. I went in partners with my brothers, and we grew to 90 employees in two plants within a year and a half. That was beyond what I thought. And then articles written about what geniuses we are and everything else. Okay, that was all cool, but guess what? Where did it end? Oh, it didn't. You just got to keep investing more. You got to keep growing. You got to keep doing this. And then I realized that's not it. The other avenues that I wanted to pursue was that of music and art and all those things. So I hit the road running. And possibly, unfortunately, everything I went to do, I achieved quickly. Got into art. Well, first of all, when I was in college, my mother, a lot of you know my story, but, you know, I'll tell it again. My mother, uh, who was driving me into the arts, my brothers and I, at a very young age, she's, you know, we call it abuse. <laughs> I took seven years of piano, didn't enjoy it. I then, then I'd take guitar lessons when I was a kid. I'd take banjo lessons, you know, the Beverly Hill type stuff. So my mom pushed, because all my mom's side of the family were into music stores and music business. So, you know, obviously you got to be there. So all these lessons, oh, yeah, you know, we'd fight, but we'd had to do it. And so that was sort of abuse. And then my mom, who was a musician and an artist, oh, we have to learn to do art. So when I'm in grade three, I'm in formal adult oil painting classes, and of course the only ones who are, you know, co-people co in the class are grandmothers from the community. <laughs> so here's a grade three, level three boy, painting oil still life with a bunch of grandmothers. That's abuse. <laughs> and so all the way through, push, 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 push. You got to learn that, you got to do that, you got to do that. And the whole while I'm saying, why can't I be just like everybody else? You know, like, I mean, I was still doing all my sports. That was a big passion for me. But my mom would drive. And then in college, my mom said, my dad was a pastor. And so that means my mom's a pastor's wife, right? That's an easy deduction. And so my mom wrote me this letter in college. She said, you ought to learn how to engrave guns. Well, I know, you know, some people, guns are evil. And, uh, but I grew up, guns were working instruments. That's how we shot the animals we ate when I grew up in the bush. That's what I was talking about last night, you know, so... Guns were just a tool to get to what you needed, food. So she says, why don't you learn to engrave guns? You've got to learn this. I don't know what she's talking about. I'm thinking the wood on the gun, carve it. I already did. She always already doing wood carving, leather carving, all that. So yeah, no big deal. Why would I want to do it on guns? And she kept pushing me, just nagged me. Oh, you got... So finally, I'm like, what are you talking about? She says, you, you take a chisel and hammer and carve the steel in the gun. Hadn't heard of that one before, so I go to a gun shop in town where I was going to university, and I said, how do you do this? Or no, first of all, what is gun engraving? Oh, crumb, here, some photos. Show me photos of this stuff where the little animals, now I don't know what your coins are like here, is the smallest one, Russell, the, the $2, right? Yeah, way smaller than a $2 piece, an animal, sometimes inlaid gold, silver, platinum, whatever, into the steel, you carve all the steel. I see this, and I'm like, whoa. Gun show happened two weeks later. I go to the gun show in town, and wouldn't you know it, one of the top 10 engravers in the United States lived 20 minutes from where I was going to school. So I saw his work at this gun show, contacted him, make a long story short, pushed the guy hard. He let me come and visit him. Eventually, after all my pushing, he lets me study under him. So I study under him for about a year and a half and get into this. And of course, what do I want out of this? I want the joy of doing the craft, but I also want recognition. And about the time I'm leaving college, one of the big gun magazines comes to him and says, do you have any protégés? Well, I'm the only one. So they write an article about me. So at the last year of my university, Gun Magazine has a big article about me. Well, that, that should have been it for the push. No, that wasn't enough. I had to keep pushing, pushing, bigger clients, more international. That's what I wanted, more recognition. Go through all that, and it's just... All the, every gun I finished, figure, oh, that's going to be the pit. No, no, I, gotta, I can do better. There's got to be another one. And push, push, push. So I began to kind of not burn out on it, but just not finding the satisfaction I expected. So all those oil painting classes and stuff, I thought, well, let's get into painting. So I started painting wildlife and stuff. Nobody cared. There's plenty of wildlife artists. So I'm trying different things to get people's attention. There's nothing working. And then one day I was, I was thinking, because see, my dad grew, before I was born, my dad had airplanes. 
So when I grew up, we had an airplane in the backyard like most people have a second car. And we got to use those planes for what I enjoyed, outdoors. So I've been all over, everywhere remote where you can get out of the airplane and say nobody's ever stood here before. You land a float plane in some remote lake. That's the way I grew up. And to me, it wasn't anything special. It's just life. But I remember one time, I was able to, uh, we flew up into the Arctic. And from there, my dad made arrangements for one of my brothers and I to jump a freight plane from there to 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And so we flew up in there, and we fished the whole time, and the sun never set when we were there. Never sets. Daylight all day long. So when you got the kind of Arctic char fishing we had there, I mean, we were burning, boy, I tell you, we didn't know what time it was, because there was much activity in, the, in what, what you'd call Eskimos, it's Inuit. Uh, but anyways, there's as much activity at 2 a.m. as there is 2 afternoon, because it doesn't make any difference, you know, nobody has a clock. So I remember all those experiences, and so as I'm trying to figure out what art form can I get into, I all of a sudden thought, you know, those weathered faces of those people when we landed, and they're all looking at you when you get out of the plane, these... Some of them maybe only 40 years old, but they look like 90, you know, because they're so beat up in the Arctic and stuff. And so I thought, I'm going to start drawing and painting a few of those just because I wanted to. And I had some photographs from back then. So I started doing that. Well, that was it. That was a ticket. Boom. Everybody wanted my artwork. And then it just expanded at all the art centers in North America. My wife and I would tour a lot, selling this art in Chicago, New York, Toronto, Los Angeles. And I made it in the art field. And then I, I pressed that into printmaking, stone lithography and aluminum lithography and, and engravings and everything, just looking for that elusive endpoint. Never came. So then I thought, okay, trying all forms of art forms, studying under a renowned remote R- Romanian artist who teaches stone lithography. So I studied under him for four years because he was in an exchange program to Canada. I found out where he's at. Every Tuesday, I took the whole day off and do nothing but stone lithos under this master to learn that. That's where you use sandstone and you create images on there and then you print off the sandstone like they used to do 300 years ago. So started doing stone lithos. Anyways, got into all that stuff, no satisfaction. You know, because I thought, if I get there, I'll be happy. Wasn't. Because it all came pretty easy. Got into music, got into all, before long, composing music. And then, then we had a band, my wife and I, for nine years. And then we started, we're on television and then we went to, when Expo World's Fair was in Vancouver, we did 12 concerts there because I wrote a whole set of music about Canadiana folk and bluegrass music and they wanted us, so they, we did 12 concerts. Anyways, make a long story short, did that bring me satisfaction? No. I'm not bringing this stuff to brag. I brag. I'm bringing this stuff up to let, to just to let you know. I experienced what it's like to reach a level that I never dreamt of and it's all empty. Meanwhile, business is going good. So, so, so the point is this. The side of my life that was all about worldly success was not paying dividends. Then I had another side of me. Since I grew up a preacher's kid, I heard a lot of sermons from places like this, and they all promised this abundant life. And yet as a a teenager growing up, I thought, what would you want out of this? And so I pretty much ignored that through my teenage life and did the opposite of whatever they're trying to teach us from the front. But I did come back to it because I realized I'm getting no satisfaction, no contentment out of this worldly pursuit. So I'll put a little more effort into a church or religious. So I did. I went back and started attending. Nothing happened. No abundant life there. In fact, it was kind of a drag, but I kept doing it. A few years went by, kept doing it. Then I started getting really frustrated because I'm not getting anything out of this, and everybody from the front just, oh, this is the best life, this is the best life, this is the best life. I got nothing out of it. In fact, I thought, okay, I know what the problem is. God has given me a lot of talent. If I'm going to give him the glory, you know, it's a big transition for me to make that admission. I'm going to start to use some of it for God. So, uh, started a few things that required, you know, I have a degree in biochemistry, that's what I took first time around. Anyways, biochemistry, and so I started this health lecture series, 
And uh, with another guy who's a professional bodybuilder who used to be in the same competitions as Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so he was kind of a drawing card, you know, guy walks in like this, me walk in like this. <laughs> but I have a degree that says I know something, although nobody knows that I daydreamed all that away, so I don't remember any of it. So anyways, we started this, hugely successful. I'm waiting for God to say, no, there is a guy I can use. Never happened. It was just a dead end. Did that for a few years, Acoloids, guy by the name Dr. Hans Deal before he started his chip program. He started phoning me constantly. What are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? How are you handling this? Who's lecturing here? What's the subject matter and everything else? So we're giving him input as to what we were doing. Anyways, after a while, you burn out because you're not getting, uh, you know, I, I went down that path thinking God's going to wake up to I'm cool. He needs me. He didn't. So then, that was a big disappointment. I did a lot of other things trying to get his attention. Then we thought, okay, by this time, all my friends had quit going to church. The only reason I'm going to church is because my wife and I have two little kids. Figure, well, we grew up that way, might as well do them. But then why would we put them through the same thing and finally have this discovery that it doesn't work? And so, so I got to the point where I figured, what possibly could God want out of me? And so, meanwhile, I see my brothers leave church, I leave all my friends leave church, and I'm sitting on the bed on church morning saying, I don't want to go to church. But we got the kids to take to church. And so it became extremely frustrating, this whole thing. So I'm thinking, why don't I like church anyways? Well, because it's boring. It, it does nothing for me. There's no impact for me whatsoever. So I got to thinking, you know, there's got to be the perfect church out there. So I get thinking about this. I'm a great daydreamer, right? I can visualize the perfect church. It took me a while to put it all together. But finally I went and I pr proposed this to some church leaders and I said, you know, well, here's what started. I heard they're going to start a new church in our town, a new plant they call them, and the target is senior citizens. And when I heard that, I thought, what kind of a, a church plant for senior citizens? Um, doesn't seem quite like anything I would see would be viable. I mean, because the point is this, not that there's anything wrong. I'm a, I'm, I'm a senior citizen now, officially. But the point is, it's because, um, you know, what is the growth potential? It's not like you're going to have kids coming up and whatever else, the number one. Number two, the seniors in my church liked it there. Why would they want to go somewhere else? They're content with going to church. And then we got the young people like myself who go up to the old ladies and look around, put my arm around and say, just don't let anybody know, but you're my favorite girlfriend. You know, just teasing and having fun, making them feel welcome. I liked all that stuff, so why would they leave? So I heard this, now that's a dumb idea. Meanwhile, I've daydreamed what the perfect church would be. So what do I do? I go and present it to church leaders and say, you know, we need a church that caters to people like myself and those that already left. And I hardly have a chance to even begin to explain it. He says, good, awesome, I want you to do it. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about it. I don't have no degrees in this. I don't have nothing. And so I'm thinking about this. I figure, yeah, he's just patronizing me. So what do I do? I go back, being in business, I know how to put together real flashy proposals. So I put a 21-page real flashy proposal together with diagrams and all this stuff because I figure there's got to be something wrong. I may mean, barely got to say how cool this church is going to be. So I put this, go back to the church leaders again. Say, here, yeah, yeah, no, awesome, cool. Didn't you hear what we said last week? We want you to do it. Well, I could go on for two hours on how that all started, but it was amazing. We start this thing after a whole year of planning, and it just explodes to 275 members in two months. And what do I know about running a church? We don't have a pastor. It's just a bunch of lay people. Lay people means, so if you don't know, that means you don't have degrees for it, you don't, you're not formally into it, you're just doing your thing and helping God sort of a thing. So for a lack of a better definition. So anyways, we start to, it just explodes, and everybody's like, whoa, what are you doing? We don't know. It's like a runaway snowball. I don't know what you have that would be comparable. But you're just chasing after it because you don't even know what's happening. But here's what started to happen to me. I'm watching all these people come to this church, and what we're after is people that already left church. That's what its target was, and it's working. Was it because I had the right formula? No, I can't even keep up with what's happening. 
I had nothing to do with it. And so, so I'm watching this thing grow, and it's like, it's totally exciting, but at the same time, something began to happen inside of me. I began to feel really empty. And here's why. Because people would come, and they're weeping at what they're finding. It's just the most incredible thing I've ever experienced. You know, I tried this years ago, and I came back, and this is like, awesome. And I'm like, really? What are you experiencing? Then they'd phone me up at night and say, oh, I just read this text. You ought to read this text out of the Bible. I'm like, yeah, fine. doesn't impact me. I don't know how it would impact you either. So I, guess what? I, had this, I began to develop a resentment to the very people that are attending this church. And I'm one of the church leaders. I resented them. And every time I'd hear a cool story about somebody's finding something, I would start to just get really gnarly inside. And a whole year into this, and everybody else thinking that we have the magic, uh, I enter a midlife crisis. Now, if you know what a midlife crisis is, you wake up one morning, and then morning after morning after morning, and you reflect on your life and you realize, I set these high goals, I eclipsed all my goals. But what's next? And it's a terrible place to be in. To, to, to look backwards and see where you've come and realize, where am I going next? And then there was that religious aspect that was taken. I heard all those talks from churches when I was a kid. Oh, it's the abundant life. No, it wasn't. Now I'm resentful. I'm full of hate, almost, to the people. And I realized... I didn't realize anything, actually. I was just completely, I hit two walls, a religious wall and a worldly wall, or, you know, worldly pursuit wall. And I was just, I just tanked. And I got very despondent about everything. I didn't dump my wife. She's still here, 45 years. <laughs> didn't buy the Ferrari. But I struggled and I struggled and I struggled. And it was like I couldn't move forward because... I was in this midlife crisis that just, that, that you just look at yourself. I was looking for relevance. I didn't find relevance in me. And the past coming to where I was didn't fulfill me in the future. I couldn't see because I figured, where does it end? It's just going to be go, 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 go. And where does it end? And that's what hit me the worst was where does it end? In fact, at the same time, I was writing a screenplay for a model, supermodel, actress model. And Robert Redford and his production, Sundance Productions, were wanting to option the movie. So, I mean, you know, I've been pursuing all these things. And even that didn't look like it was going to satisfy me. So here I am. I don't want to really hardly work anymore. I really don't want to do all my creative things anymore. Church certainly is out. Uh, it's where do you go from here? Midlife crisis. And my wife was worried, no doubt about it. Because I was just, I was directionless. I was rudderless. I was just, just grasping at straws as to what to do next. And I was in that state, I don't know, six months, a year, who knows what it was. Terrible state. Not wanting anything to do with the church anymore, but because people are, you know, are, are leaning on you to do stuff, I'm still hanging in there, but not enjoying any part of it. So I finally come to this wake-up point, if you want to call it that, because what do you do when you're in the throes of a midlife crisis? I thought about my pursuit of God through the years, my pursuit of God through religion, because I'd already figured out religion pays no dividends. I'm telling you that right now. Religion does not pay dividends. And so it hadn't paid dividends with me, so why would I continue with it? But there was one little nagging thing always in my mind. Have you ever tried to have a relationship with the God of this religion? And I thought about it, I thought, you know, I spoke, I've preached a lot of Sermons. I've lectured a lot here at the church that I belong to uh, under my own power in the Bible to figure out what I'm going to talk about. None of that paid any dividends. But there's always one little nagging thing. And I'd heard this, I heard this idea about trying an hour a day. There's a couple of ladies that I'd listened to. One of them happened to be Mother Teresa. And she said, and I got it in my, she says, if you'd spend an hour a day uh, in pursuing Jesus, in her summary, you'll be all right. Not much of an epistle. Another little lady, read a few people, they said, hour, and I thought, 
hour a day. I don't have time for that. I'm in business. And now I really don't really want much to do with the Bible thing anymore. But I thought about that for a few days and I thought, what if? What if I forget religion and skip that, bypass that, and see what can happen if I go after the God of that religion? And so I, I, I cut a deal and I was sharing with the young, young guys this morning with Scott Penman. And, and here's the thing. Um, I cut a lot of deals in business with God. I shared this with them, so redundant for some of you guys. I cut a lot of deals with God in my business life. God, if you give me this level of success, I'll give you this. But all my deals were that way. This way, to summarize it. God, I'm going to go buy this lottery ticket for a dollar. It's for a million dollars. If I win it, I'll give you half of it. That sounds like a logical God deal, doesn't it? But you know what? God never reciprocated in any one of my deals. I cut the sweetest deals with God you've ever matched, you've ever heard of. He never reciprocated. Because guess what? Took me a number of years to figure this out. It's all backwards. My deals were, God, you give it to me first. Now, God, you're going to have to have faith in me that I'll perform what I said I would do. And then I started looking at God's promises. He says, give. Who does it first? Me. And then I'm going to give back with a net gain. Forgive, and then I'm going to forgive you with a net gain. Draw an eye unto me. In other words, you come to me, and I will draw an eye unto you. And I realize, oh my, I've had it all backwards. God is telling me, I want you to have faith in me, not the other way around. God is telling me, empty your wallet, see what happens. Empty your talent base, see what happens. Empty your time allotment, see what happens. Changed my life. But my deal with God, all these deals I cut in business, God never reciprocated. So this deal was a little bit different. This time, I'm giving up first. I'm giving up time, and I'm busy. So just for me to spend an hour a day is like, pff, I don't know how I'm going to do it. But for me to do it, I have to get up at 5.30 in the morning. I mean, some of you probably do that every morning. I didn't have to, but I had to in order to fit my day in. So I got up at 5.30 the first morning. I thought this was going to be it. I mean, God is just going to come plowing through me, you know, because waiting for this deal. So I get up, alarm goes, 5.30. I go straight upstairs, look at my watch to the minute. This is a deal. And I start praying, last a few minutes, start reading, Keep looking at my, oh, I got five more minutes. Oh, I got three more minutes. Oh, one more. Oh, I'm done. What I get out of it? Nothing. Do it the next morning? Nothing. Don't want to do it anymore. But my wife always accuses me of being stubborn and bullheaded because I'm 50% Norwegian and 50% German. <laughs> She's all German, so. So sorry, Raphael, if you're here. No offense. We can claim that because that's in our heritage. Anyhow, so, so the point is, is I stuck with it. Why? I don't know. Because I got nothing out of it. Week two, three, four weeks go by. At about week four, I begin to notice something different. Radically different. God's now withdrawing his presence from me. Now that's a really dumb thing to say in front of people when you're trying to say God is good. But he started withdrawing his presence to the point where I've never been so spiritually parched in my life. Now, there's a reason for this. Now, if I forget, somebody put their hand up and say, get to the reason in case I forget it. Because that'd be a real bad statement to end on. But he did. I was empty. So from four weeks to six weeks, I couldn't sleep anymore because all I could do at night is just, oh, man, I don't even know if you're real, God. I, I've been told that. I really don't know if you are real. If you are, I don't even know if it's worth it. And then... With no sleep, I couldn't work. I'm frazzled. I'd sit there trying to design a machine or something, and it's like, get your head together. Focus, focus, couldn't. So for two weeks, my life was just a complete shambles. That, was, that led me to six full weeks. I knew when I started this deal. I was logging this. This was, this was a documented deal. So six weeks. Uh, sorry, no. 60 days, two months. I, I, I realized that's it. I didn't make the deal of 60 days up front, but I was keeping track. And I thought, waste of time. I get up, and instead of praying, 
It was a conversation. I wouldn't call it a prayer. It was just a conversation, a one-way conversation. I laid down on the carpet and I said, I'm sick and tired of you. I don't know if this, I don't even know if you're real. If you are real, I hardly see the value in pursuing this. I don't want anything more to do with you. I'm done. It's over. It was a little more than that. But I get up from that conversation, and now I'm really stirred up. You know, because if you believe something all your life, sometimes during your life it's kind of in the background, not really there, but if you believe it, now all of a sudden you're, what you believe in, you say, done with it. Yeah, you know, you get a bit of an anxiety attack. That's what I had. So I'm standing there in the dark, because that's when it is at 5.30 in the morning. I'm standing in the dark, and I'm thinking, what do I do now? I'm really frustrated now. Go back to bed. No, there's no chance I could sleep now. Should I go to work? No, that's not going to work, because I'm really worked up now. And then and I think, well, there's my two options. But then I see the Bible laying there in the dark. And I'm thinking, why would I pick that rag up anymore? It's a waste of time. And I look at that again. If nah. Look at my other option. Nah. Probably 20 minutes. I don't remember. It was a long time. No voices, nothing. Just a tiny little bit of logic. Can't go to sleep for sure. Can't go to work. Why would I read that again? But pff, I'm here. I pick my Bible up. After, just after telling God off. Open the pages. Don't even remember. It doesn't matter. Started reading everything I read. Skip the intelligent part of it. In other words, the intellectual part. In other words, you read the Bible and then you try to decipher. What does this mean? It's all so complicated. Let's read it again. Okay, Five, fifth time we read it, it's sort of getting it. And then you figure, okay, now how would I apply that to my life? You reach for the application, gone. You know, it's just this intellectual thing. Skip my brain completely and just plowed into my soul. What was I wait, looking for my whole life? Relevance. I was looking for something to fill this void. See, we all have this void. And there's this guy by the name of Blade, Blaise Pascal in the 1500s. Scientist. And uh, Pascal's, we, we measure pressure that way. I, in my business, even, we measure pressure. So it's always a reminder. But he went on a pursuit to see if God was even plausibly real. By the time it was all done, his conclusion was this. There's a God-shaped vacuum in every man. And so now all of a sudden I'm reading and everything is just plowing into me. And... Ten minutes of this incredible experience of not having to intellectualize it before I felt it, I burst into tears. And you know what? I'm a tough guy. I don't cry much. I've broken every bone you can playing hockey and stuff. Not every bone, but I've sure been busted up through the years. I don't cry. You just be a tough guy. Yeah, I might whine a lot, you know, but anyways. <laughs> so I'm crying, and I don't know. I'm thinking I'm losing my mind. What am I crying for? I mean, there's nothing emotional about what I'm reading here, and it's just like, and then I thought, oh, ooh, this is all weird. You know, maybe there's the dark side's trying to do something to me. I don't know. So I rebuke the dark side and whatever. So, I'm, so, I, do the, so I continue reading as best I can through tears. My wife finally gets up to go. She's a school teacher, so to go to work. She sees me just in shambles. She did the right thing. Just leave him alone. I don't know what's going on. He's going through this <laughs> midlife crisis. He needs to cry about it. Let him cry. I don't know what she's thinking. But anyways, she left me alone. Went, and for two hours, I'm just struggling to read through tears. And everything is just plowing into me. And I'm thinking, I have never experienced anything so relevant, so powerful in my life. And so, next morning comes, I figure, Where? could be a one-shot deal. Could be you just lost your mind for one day. Who knows? Get up the next morning, and discernment was there again. And I want to tell you something. My life exploded with relevance. I could have never imagined what was going to take place in my life from that point on. Just so I don't forget, because I'm sure my wife's going to raise her hand in a second here. Why did God withdraw his presence from me? I, I couldn't figure that out for that two weeks. It's because he needed me to understand when the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. When the Bible says, Seek as you would silver and hid treasure. When the Bible says, Only those who diligently seek me will find me. God needed me to understand. You want me? You want my son, Jesus? Be passionate about it. Seek him first. And by withdrawing his presence, when I can't have something, I get more passionate about it. I don't know if you're that way. But if there's a new fishing reel or a new rifle I want or whatever, and I, and I ha haven't been able to get it, I get more passionate about it. I get fixated on it. Well, that's what God wants us to be with his son. Get fixated on him. 
have passion about them. And that's why God withdrew, so that I got to the point where if I couldn't have it, I want it more. And my life changed. And guess what? I don't care who you are, what your life situation is, or whatever. I can guarantee this beyond any shadow of a doubt, because I get hundreds of emails from all over the world. Not about me speaking. No, it's about what they tried. They decided to give God a serious shot. And you know how all emails start? You wouldn't believe. They all start that way. You wouldn't believe. I love it. Because they couldn't believe that it was possible. And it is possible. And God is so good. Because here's the thing. When you find him, he doesn't say, okay, reorder of everything. I don't want you to make money anymore. I don't want you to live where you live and have your own freedom. I'm going to take you and dump you in the middle of somewhere you'd never want to be. That's a worry. He didn't say that. No, wherever you go, I will give you the desire of your heart. It says in Psalms 37, 4. I'll give you the desire of your heart if you put your trust in me. So God allows you to have a life, but at the same time, if you're there to serve him, if you're there to be a light for him, he's going to be there with you. And so he gives you this abundant life. I didn't have to give up my artwork. I didn't have to give up my music. Still do it. Difference is, I tithe my artwork. I tithe my music. That's meaning this. Tithe means this. You give back a portion of the talent God has given you. And when you do, he gives you a net gain. Where does that gain come? More freebies to people through music or art or whatever it is? No. More recognition in the world so that you can sell your art for more money. And, I'm not, and we're not talking just about money here. Because here's the point. Money is a massive distraction. It has been in my life. I finally figured that out. It's a massive distraction. It is tough to manage when you're pursuing Jesus. Because money always throws dangling little carrots in front of your face. All distractions from God. And I still suffer from that one. I'm not going to lie. A job offer comes and I look at that and I figure, okay, that's going to be six months. I'm going to make a ton of money on that. But then i got to go speak here and i got to go speak there. I could cancel those, take this job. Then you figure, nope, it's about priorities. So I have to be a little more disciplined that. So what I do is I, I limit myself what I take out of my company for reason. Not, I'm, I'm not saying everybody has to do that. I'm just saying that's what I have to do to control my own carnal desires of wanting more. And then what's excess? Let God use it, let God have it. It's changed my perspective. It allows me to be content. It allows me to say, because here's the way I used to do it, years and years ago, when I first started traveling, people say, would you, I mean, what would anybody want some twit from a back street in British Columbia to come and speak at a church? Are you kidding me? I never wanted to ever do that. It's never, in fact, I'd tell my dad, I'm never going to be a preacher. I'd tell him, that was my, part of my rebellion. Because that was his career. I said, I, you would never get me to be a preacher, ever. You'd never get me to teach school, ever. <laughs> and so, very resolute. But when God takes over, priorities change. So when somebody invited me to go speak somewhere, I'm thinking, what? I'd be on the airplane and say, why did I say yes? Are you kidding me? I do that all the time. Still do it. And so here's the way it was with me, though. Somebody would say, can you come and speak? It's going to be 10 days of your time. I'm thinking, I can't do that. This was years and years ago. I, th I, I can't do that. Because here's what I would do. I'd figure 10 days of work at my bill-out rate as an engineer and the bill-out rate of what my guys get because I've designed this, I would look at it this way. I'm going to be losing this much money if I take this gig to go speak somewhere. And I would... I did that for vacations, too. My wife could attest. I'd say, let's go for two weeks up to my, our family's cabin up in northern BC. No, that'll cost me this much money. That's the way I was measuring things. So when I started, you know, speaking around the world and stuff, which takes blocks of time, I thought, okay, I'll do one a year. Treat it sort of like a vacation. And then I get back, and I thought, hmm, didn't seem to miss much. Next year, two. Oh, that's a big risk. Because it's costing me money. I started putting value on my time away from my business. And, and I soon began to realize, I'm not missing anything. 
the blessing I get from going over there and doing that way outweighs the dollars I may lose. So that's the way I was analyzing it. So I just have to build myself in a little bit of a disciplined situation so that stuff doesn't become a deterrent to me and a, and a temptation because it's always there. The temptation's always there. Take a salary, live on it. What's left? Let God have it. And do I ever worry that God's not going to bring me to work? Here's what's amazing. I'm here for a month this trip. Not that I'm bragging about time taking off or anything else. I'm here a month. Am I worried about what's going on? No, I don't care. And did I have a job that's critical of my time while I'm gone? No. But when I get back, I know what's going to happen because i got a bit of a break between next travels. God's going to have a job there. I don't worry about it because that's the kind of God he is. And when you give it over to him, so if any of you are, are, are exploring this whole concept of is God worth it and does God pay dividends, I'm telling you, I can guarantee beyond a shadow of a doubt it does. But here's what it boils down to. Do you want him bad enough to spend time having a relationship with him? Because can you have a relationship with humans without time invested? Nope. My wife, I shared that a week or so, got another lecture here. My wife, when I first saw her, hmm, she claims when she first saw me, hmm, so we could have just said, bag the courting, let's go get married. No, guess what? Courting's tough, no doubt about it. You know, all the little games and stuff, and you know, you can never figure them out. And so, anyways, so I never once thought, what's the minimum time I can spend with her to get her to the altar? I, I never thought about that. I couldn't get enough of her. It was... I'll, I'll leave that because that could be misconstrued, but whatever. <laughs> it was a passionate pursuit, let's just put it that way. Okay, so, so the point is, no time spent, no relationship, no marriage. Then we come to God. What did I do most of my life? Oh, I'd love to have this abundant life. I'd love to have this relationship. What's the minimum I can put into to get it? And when I finally realized it doesn't work that way, And when I finally realized, because you don't know, it's like if I had the Ferrari, I'd be happy. Well, you don't know, because you haven't had one. But all those who do have them seem to be, you know, disillusioned with life or whatever else. So you figure, if I spend a bunch of time to get Jesus, is it worth it? Hmm, don't know, because I've never had a relationship with him. All I can say, talk to anybody who's figured it out, and they will guarantee, and back it with money if they have to, that it is worth every minute you spent pursuing Jesus. He is worth every minute you put into him. The rewards you get back is beyond marriage. So my idea is, the way I say it is this. If it seems too ominous to figure out how am I going to communicate someone I can't see, how am I going to try to connect with somebody I can't see, can't touch them, can't see them, how am I going to do that? Treat it as courtship. Date Jesus. Okay, I know it sounds weird. But just pursue them like you would a date. And just go on gradual dates. Just spend time together. And guess what? He will come to you. That's a guarantee. That's why I get all these letters. You wouldn't believe what's happening in my life. It is so rewarding. There's lots of times where I have to, you know, maybe five trips a year or whatever for blocks of time away from home. My wife's holding the fort at home and I just get home a couple of weeks and I'm ready to go again and she'll break down, she'll admit it, she'll break down and cry, is it worth it? How do you explain that? Is it worth it? I don't know. I don't know what happens when you leave. But there's always a few of those emails coming through so I said, go read the emails. Comes back crying harder, okay. <laughs> go. You know, and, and, and what am I doing here? Like this is stupidity to think I have no education to speak, I don't have any theology degree, I have nothing. Here's the amazing thing, is God will have you doing things that you don't even want to do sometimes, but but you realize this is a divine calling. It's something beyond me. It's something I shouldn't be here, but guess what? For some reason, God sees just a tiny fragment of validity in my life to say, "Ah, wish we had a better option, but let's send him. (laughs) And guess what? To see God move and see God work is beyond any multi-million dollar deal. Beyond any, to sit down in front of a CEO of a company. I'll share one story here, story of the time. One last story quick here. This just happened, the reason why I'll share it. And it's not completely finished, but it's phenomenal. So I'm doing this 
a bunch of projects for this company in Canada. It's called Atlantis. And it's, it's a re recycling. They shred tires and we're taking the fibers. So we developed equipment to get the fiber, the poly fibers and the cotton fibers out of the tires to now use a structural reinforcement in concrete, which I do a lot of that work anyways with poly fibers. Well, too much information. But anyway, so the point is, is now you've got a green solution to something that takes energy before. So it's, a, it's all about carbon footprint now, right? So they, they come to me to develop these solutions how to do this. So we've done it. We built the test the equipment and everything else. And I've, been, and I've been talking to this guy a lot, and he's a former pilot. He's a former pilot with a major airline in Canada, and he's flying 767 airplanes. And uh, during the COVID thing, things got all messed up, and he'd already been pursuing this project, so he quit his job as a pilot. And now he's doing this company. And so he and a bunch of investors are getting us, my company, to develop all this stuff. So we're doing that. But I look at him, and... And he's not a believer in anything. I wouldn't say that he's a hardcore atheist, just not a believer. And so I'm having these lunches, business meetings and all that. I'm thinking, oh, man, how do I breach the subject, you know? And so here, three weeks before I come here, uh, I'm on a phone conversation with him. And it takes a bit of a turn from the business part of it. And he says, so, because I told him I'll be gone. So I said, I'll be gone for a whole month. He says, where are you going? I said, Australia. He said, Wow. You know, we're just ramping up right now and you're going to be gone? And I says, well, it's the way it bounces. He says, like, what are you doing? Vacation? I said, no. What are you doing? I says, well, I, I lecture, I, I speak, you know, I talk about God things. And, and he says, really? Why would you do that? I said, well, it's a good point. I don't get paid a dime for any of it. But I said, that's what I do. So now he's interested. He said, well, what do you talk about? I said, well, go to YouTube. I don't know who puts this stuff there. I don't even know how to put it there. But go to YouTube and you can see... <laughs> some of this stuff, you know, do your research if you want. And so anyway, so, so I get talking to him. Well, then he wants a luncheon. So he, he went to YouTube. So he wants a lunch date. So, I, so we go to a company that's a big asphalt company that's going to be taking some of this fiber. We got a big trial coming up to put this in asphalt, you know, the pavement for anti-shrink crackage from cold weather. We don't have to worry about it here. Anyway, so we got that all coming on as soon as I get back. So the point is, we go, to this, we go to this company, big asphalt company. From there, we go for the lunch at 10 a.m. Well, who goes to lunch at 10 a.m.? I had breakfast at home. He says, let's go to lunch. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I, I'm, I'm really busy here, but I'll, I'll go to lunch. Well, guess what it's all about? He's empty. He wants to know, what do I have? And I thought, how am I going to breach the subject? So I thought, let's get into logic first. I've never done this before, actually. And I said, you know, I said, here's what's amazing. Um... I believe, part of, part of the thing that gives me uh, a sense of purpose and a sense of hope and everything is the fact that I believe I was created. And I said, I know that goes completely against everything that we're taught in high schools, colleges, and everything else. It's the opposite of evolution. But I said, what that does is it opens the door for maybe there's a reason for my life, and I live off that. I said, I feed off that. It gives me power. And so I said, and he says, interesting. So you don't believe in evolution? I says, well, I believe in microevolution, you know, where you know, a, bird, a rabbit with bigger legs is going to survive being chased by coyotes, so when they breed with other rabbits with big legs, they're going to all have bigger legs. So I, I believe in that, but I said, no, not from a rabbit came from a single cell. So I'm explaining this. And then so, so he's saying, really? And I thought, oh, where am I go what am I going this direction for? I've never done that before. And so then I said, I gave him this analogy. I said, okay, this, you're a logical person. I said, what are the odds of this happening? I said, okay, so we start from a single cell, and because of mutations, which always go downward, not upwards, and he gets that, and I said, from, it keeps adapting, 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 to the point where there's, you have to have two patterns of evolution taking place that are parallel, a male and a female. So I just said, okay, so you got a male coming along through evolution. Now, there's lots of things that could have ended that chain. Maybe a meteorite hit, boom, males are gone, females keep going. And I said, so now all of a sudden, the two seem to peak out at the same time. She's got an egg, he has sperm. Now they got to figure out how do we exchange those. I mean, I know, it's probably, uh, uh, see, i got imagination, you don't. But anyways, <laughs> so... My wife just went like, that's okay, I'm going too deep. <laughs> Point is, I explained all this, and I said, so what are the odds that you get a parallel evolution taking place that peaks at the same time, you figure it all out, and nine months later, you figure it out what you figured out, and now you got offspring. 
I said, what are the odds? And he says, whoa, you got to be kidding. I've never thought about it. I said, yeah, you know what, how you figure out odds? How many times did you roll the dice to have that happen? He says, oh, man, you blow my mind with that one. So I gave him some other ones. And then finally I said, so here's the reason I'm bringing that up. Is that because I said, the Bible says the opposite of that. It said there's an intelligent designer. And that makes sense. And I'm not here to tell you it's God, but you'll probably soon figure out. This guy is so hungry now, he's asking me, like, like how do you know? How do you have a, I mean, is there a chance? Like, how do you have a relationship with this God and everything? So I can't wait to get back, because we're in the middle of all this now. So now our conversation is like 20% business and 80% questions. But the point is, is, what are the odds of the evolution, the way I said, but what are the odds that I meet a guy like that, and God somehow decides to use the creation-evolution argument to get the thing going, because I didn't think of that, and then to have a guy hungry now, a guy that has influence, because influence runs downhill. I don't know about you. I didn't plan that. I had nothing to do with that. And here, for those who never tried God, here's the cool thing. I call those divine appointments. This is where this God that you can't see, the God you can't touch, the God that will give you a relationship with him, I guarantee it'll happen, this God will then line you up for the most incredible life you will ever experience. You will see things take place that you cannot fathom. Things take place that you can never roll the dice enough to know that happens. I said, those are all the little quiet moments that says, I'm real, I'm here, you are my partner, and I need you. You know, when you see how big God is, and to think that God needs me, and he needs you, that in and of, in of, of itself is the most incredible discovery you'll ever make. i yeah. 
This is on. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's such a beautiful song. It reminds me of a, a story in the Bible, John chapter 15. It's considered as one of the lost chapters because it speaks about humanity being lost, whether you're inside of the house, outside of the house. We're all lost to some degree. And Herb mentioned a man, Soren Kierkegaard, that spoke about this void in our heart. He was just quoting another man that wrote hundreds of years before that, Augustine, that wrote the same thing. And Herb experienced that. And I think all of us, to a degree, have experienced this void in our hearts. But as Herb has uh, spoken about, God is there and He wants to fill that. And that's just the echo of, of Luke 15, where God is the one that's seeking us. We always think that we're seeking for God, we're searching for God. But God has always been about seeking His people, seeking you and me. And uh, this afternoon, we're going to continue this journey on how what does that look, us, look like as we grow closer and yearn for that relationship with God. So we're going to invite all of you to join us this afternoon at 3 o'clock. But now we're going to go to lunch. We're going to invite all of you to join us for lunch. There will be a lunch outside. You can grab some food, a plate, a seat, and we'll have lunch till about 3 when we come in for our, our next service. So let's pray together for the food. Gracious Father, thank you for this beautiful message. Thank you for using Herb and for um, drawing close to him and drawing close to all of us, Lord. As we go out now, we've been spiritually nurtured. We pray now, Lord, that you will use the food to nurture us and strengthen our bodies as well, Lord. So we pray the hands that have prepared the food, we say thank you for them. We pray that you will bless the hands, Lord. We also pray that you will bless the food to nourish our bodies. Thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you at lunch and this afternoon at three o'clock again. Thank you.